Very good. We're on page, well, in my book, what's left of my book, uh, page 167. And uh, they're having a conversation about the practice of contemplative prayer. And uh, the pilgrim uh, makes, a, makes an observation that he's noticed that some people who practice contemplative prayer uh, but run into an obstacle in their life, either some attachment or some vice that they can't quite let go of. Uh, he says here, he says, I've also met other people who most unhappily, after knowing the way of silence and prayer of the heart, have, on meeting some obstacle or sinful weakness, given way to depression and given up the inward activity of the heart, which they had known. And, uh, you know, this, this is something, I, when I think about my days of depression, I, I kind of was trying to analyze here if that was something that I was going through at the time and there's a possibility it could be interpreted that way I'm not I'm not saying that that all depression is caused by the same thing that would be silly but I think it's one of the things that can add to a, to a to a depression is when you're not being true to to your own ideal you know in a in a in a in an unhealthy way, you know, if you're working through it and you've got your focus on it and you're going for it, yet, you know, then we all are at different, you know, we all have obstacles, we all have challenges. But when you've actually kind of got a foot in both oars, you know, or if you, you can't really fully decide, you know, or you, you know that you're kind of holding onto something, kind of not sure that you can let go of it, uh, that, that that causes some inner turmoil. And uh, that's why we were talking earlier in the week about really needing to turn our back, uh, taking a turn your back form of renunciation where, you know, you don't, you don't wrestle and keep entertaining and wrestling and entertaining and wrestling, uh, but that you take a sincere turn away from it, which means when you're exposed from it, you, you run away. You know, you don't make excuses for why all oh, this isn't so bad or this is okay but you really see the danger in it and turn away from it. And the professor here comes in and says something, and, uh, but it's, it's something that gets challenged in the next paragraph. He says, yes, that is very natural. I myself have experienced the same thing at times on occasions when I have lapsed from the interior frame of mind or done something wrong. For since inward prayer of the heart is a holy thing, and union with God is not unseemly and a thing not to be dared to bring a holy thing into a sinful heart without having first purified it by silent contrite penitence and a proper preparation for communion with God. It is better to be dumb before God than to offer him thoughts, thoughtless words out of a heart which is in darkness and distraction. But that's a very common churchy thing to think or to say. You know, like, how dare you go into the shrine impure or how dare you sit to meditate when, you know, you're, you've been impure or you've been you've entertained worldly ideals or worldly thoughts. And uh, it's a common way of thinking. And quite often we also take that on. You know, we don't if we've done wrong or we're having a difficult time, we're not doing well spiritually quite often we get an aversion to going into the shrine because there's the light in the shrine, you know, and that light makes us aware and makes us face uh, that pain, uh, which is fine, but it, but it's not fine if you've let go and if you've turned away from it and you're making a sincere effort to turn toward the beloved, the best place to go in the midst of your impurities the and your failures, the best place to go is the shrine. You know, there's an infinite amount of grace there, but you won't let yourself feel that if you hold on uh, to your vice simultaneously. If you haven't let go of it, uh, then that's a different scenario. Uh, and it's not that God is going to do anything about that. It's that you're going to hurt yourself because you carry your karma in your mind. And that hypocrisy, you know, burns. It, it's painful. And so... Uh, it shouldn't be there. <laughs> it has to go. But the monk, the monk here, has a has a, a retort to him. He says, "It is a great pity that you think like that. That is despondency, 
which is the worst of all sins and constitutes the principal weapon of the world of darkness against us. The teaching of our experienced holy fathers about this is quite different. Nicetus Stephatus says that if you have fallen and sunk down, even into the depths of hellish evil, even then you are not to despair, but to turn quickly to God, and he will speedily raise you from your fallen heart and give you more strength than you had before. So after every fall and sinful wounding of the heart, the thing to do is immediately to place it in the presence of God for healing and cleansing, just as things that have become infected, if they are exposed for some time to the power of the sun's rays, lose the sharpness and strength of their infection. Many spiritual writers speak positively about this inner conflict with the enemies of salvation, our passions. If you receive wounds a thousand times, still, you should by no means give up the life-giving action, that is to say, calling upon Jesus Christ who is present in our hearts. Our actions not only ought not to turn us away from walking in the presence of God and from inward prayer, and so produce disquiet, depression, and sadness in us, but rather it should further our swift returning to God. The infant who is led by its mother when it begins to walk turns quickly to her and holds on to her firmly when it stumbles. This is the right attitude. The other one was a worldly interpretation uh, of spiritual life, a worldly ideal of God, a, a misunderstanding of the nature of God. You know, it's it's that it's that churchy thing. And I, you know, I'm not saying that about any particular church. I'm just kind of framing it in a way where we judge people, you know, people, and, and so accordingly we judge ourselves. And, you know, it's, it, it cannot be stressed enough that God is always your safe harbor. God is always your safe haven. Whatever condition you're in, if you can whimper the name of God, you know, she will run to you and, 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 and pick you up, rescue you from your situation. And it doesn't matter if you do it a thousand times in a row. You know, the mother is there to pick you up and to carry you forward. Do not lose faith in that. Do not give up because of your failings, right? Your value, again, I will say, your value as a human being is not according to your performance and your uh, achievement. Your value of, uh, as a human being is because of the divine image that is manifest in you. you know, that's why Tapuor told uh, the, the, the maid, you know, dive deep, see all of the gems that lie scattered in your heart. Pick them up, take them. Those are your value. The greatest gem of all lies as the treasure in your heart, the presence of God. And so you always have that. That is who you are and what you are regardless of the condition of your mind and your body, that is always who you are, that inner spark of the divine, that manifestation of pure love and infinite potential in being. And that is what you focus on. That is what you hold on to. And, and, and all of the guilt and the discouragement, you have to learn to renounce through grace, through an acceptance of the grace of the divine. Your faith, in an unconditioned love for you. And so you get up and you always keep going. The hermit says, I look at it in this way, that the spirit of despondency and agitating and doubting thoughts are aroused most easily by distraction of the mind and failure to guard the silent resort of one's inner self right? That the, this, is the, this is the accuser, the ego, which counts on, <laughs> counts on weakening your dependence or your ideal, your striving for any ideal other than its own. Uh, you know, that, that anything other than a selfish thought is unhappy for the ego. And so it tries, it's, it's, it's when we're not guarding the mind. You know, we talked about that at length this morning, 
in, in the Advaita class that you have to strive. We must strive with all of our energy because it's, it's priceless. It's a priceless experience. It's a priceless, priceless, priceless experience to touch mother in the heart, to touch the divine in the heart, and to even get a split second taste of that bliss. You know, it's worth everything we have, worth, worth everything in life. And we should have that attitude. We should have that feeling toward our practice. And if you do that, oh, excuse me, <laughs> if you do that, you will find mother, you will find her in your very own heart. And, 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 and when you have found that, the joy that you will experience for not having given up, for not having walked away, for not having lost your hope, lost your trust, will be immense and deep and, 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 and wonderful. And so, and once you, once you do find that shrine within, once you are able to, to feel a touch of that divine bliss, simply by putting your attention in the, in the shrine, in your heart, that, 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 that guarding of your heart will become second nature. That's what I say, don't, don't get more than one or two thoughts away from your mantra, you know, because that's, that's about as far as you can safely go. If you go more than one or two thoughts beyond your mantra, you know, you could get caught up in a state of mind and it's very difficult to find your way out of that. And so he's saying here that a lot of this despondency, a lot of this hopelessness, a lot of this defeated sort of feeling, uh, this self, this self flatulation, you know, uh, is because you haven't guarded the heart and you've fallen into your ego, which is going to judge. The ego, which always finds division, always finds boundary, uh, will, will, will whisper these hurtful things into your ear to prevent you from returning to the process of dismantling it, dismantling the ego. The ancient fathers, in their divine wisdom, won the victory over despondency and received inward light and strength through hope in God, through peaceful silence and solitude. And they have given us wise and useful counsel. Sit silently in your cell, and it will teach you everything. It's because that knowledge is yours already. Again, it's the noisy mind. It's the mind full of thinking, contradictory thoughts and ideas that, that distracts us and prevents us from seeing the truth of our nature, our oneness with the beloved. But the oneness of our beloved is permanent. It, it, it cannot go away, even if it's not paid attention to and even if it's not seen. And so we can know that this truth will prevail within you. Your, your realization is, is purely a matter of time. Like Takor says, you've been bitten by, by the cobra. <laughs> you have one or two days at most, he says, you know, before you come to your realization. And Takor is that is is the venom of that cobra, you know, his message of this divine love of God, and not just Takor. You know, Jesus is also that cobra, Rama, and Sita, <laughs> and Holy Mother, and Buddha. All of them are there, and so sit silently in your cell. And silent I means silently in the mind, silence the mind, sit quietly with your attention on the presence of mother, and you will you'll be fine. That is all that is necessary. Awareness is is the healing sap of our wrong thinking. Because, because it's wrong thinking, and the presence of God within us is the only fact, the only truth. And so it will outshine any of the other misinformation that we've got floating around up there in that noisy web of the mind. The professor, I have such confidence in you that I will listen very gladly to your critical analysis of my thoughts about the silence which you praise so highly and the benefits of the solitary life which hermits so love to lead. Well, this is what I think. Since all people, by the law of nature ordained by the creator, are placed in necessary dependence upon one another, and therefore are bound to help one another in life. 
to labor for one another and to be of service to one another. This sociability makes the well-being of the human race and shows love for one's neighbor. But the silent hermit who has withdrawn from human society, in what way can he, in his inactivity, be of service to his neighbor? And what contribution can he make to the well-being of human society? He completely destroys in himself that law of the creator which concerns union in love of one's kind and beneficent influence upon the brotherhood. All right, so this is an interesting argument. It's an argument that happens in monasticism all the time. You know, do we cloister or do we serve? Do we cloister or do we serve? And that's why the Ramakrishna order has the mat and the mission. The mats are monasteries, they're cloistered for the development of inner, internal silence, the development of the present, awareness of the presence uh, within us. And the missions are outward facing. The missions are doing the hospitals and the, and the, uh, uh, the orphanages and the schools and the relief work, you know, and feeding the hungry, those things. So both are necessary, but they are not mutually exclusive. It's really by disposition. For those who are able to discipline themselves and sit and do the interior work and that silent work, you know, they have that silent disposition. It's, it, that is a wonderful service. You know, Vivekananda says that one man sitting in ecstasy on the mountaintop does more service to the world than a thousand people building hospitals. You know, that, 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 stirring of universal mind, that influence of, of realization on the world. That's why a Jesus or a, a Ramakrishna, you know, Ramakrishna who, who never left his temple really, except to do a pilgrimage here and there, you know, never wrote anything, never gave a public lecture, never, you know, did any advertising, didn't ever write anything. And yet his name has gone around the world. And here 150 years later, we have his picture on our shrines. That's the power of the person who's able to do that internal work, right? That internal work, their influence on the world will be felt. Equally so for someone like a St. Teresa, you know, uh, in, in Calcutta. Is that St. Teresa? Yeah, right? That did all the service to the, to the poor in Calcutta and carried them to the, you know, would go out on the streets and pick up the sick and fallen uh, homeless people and carry them in her arms to, to her hospital to nurture them and nurse them back to life. Uh, and so you see the impact that she had on the world, right? But Vivekananda says that, that even higher though is, is that attainment of samadhi, that, that calm and peaceful mind, but that even if you're alone in a cave, you will affect the whole world with that. So here he's having this conversation. So our our uh, our professor, who's so far given two rather wrong views, <laughs> is now going is now going to be corrected by the hermit. The hermit says, "Since this view of yours about silence is incorrect, the conclusion you draw from it." will not hold good. Let us consider it in detail. One, the man who lives in silent solitude is not only living in a state of inactivity and idleness, he is in the highest degree active, even more than one who takes part in the life of society. He untiringly, untiringly acts according to his highest rational nature. He is on guard, he ponders, he keeps his eye upon the state and progress of his moral existence. This is the true purpose of silence. And in the measure that this, minister, that this ministers to his own improvement, it benefits others for whom undistracted submergence within themselves for the development of the moral life is impossible. For he who watches in silence by communicating his inward experiences, either by word in the exceptional cases, or by committing them to writing, promotes the spiritual advantage and the salvation of his brothers. He does more and that of a higher kind than the private benefactor, because the private emotional charities of people in the world are always limited 
by the small number of benefits conferred. Whereas he who confers benefits by morally attaining to convincing and tested means of perfecting the spiritual life becomes a benefactor to the whole world. His experience and teaching pass on from generation to generation as we see ourselves and of which we avail ourselves from ancient times to this day. And this is no sense different from Christian love. It even surpasses it in its results. Two, the benefit, the beneficent and most useful influence of the man who observes silence upon his neighbors is not only shown in the communication of his instructive observations upon the interior life, but also the very example of his separated life benefits the attentive layman who leading him to self-knowledge and arousing in him the feeling of reverence. The man who lives in the world hearing of the devout recluse or going past the door of his hermitage, feels an impulse to the devout life, has recalled to his mind what man can be upon this earth, that it is possible for man to get back to that primitive contemplative state in which he issued from the hands of his creator. The silent recluse teaches by his very silence and by his very life he benefits and edifies and persuades to the search of God. Three, this benefit springs from genuine silence, which is illuminated and sanctified by the light of grace. But if, silent, if the silent one did not have these gifts of grace, which make him a light to the world, even if he should have embarked upon the way of silence with the purpose of hiding himself from society of his kind as the result of sloth and indifference, even then, he would confer a great benefit upon the community in which he lives, just as the gardener cuts off the dry and barren branches and clears away the weeds so that the growth of the best and the most useful may be, may be unimpeded. And this is a great deal. It is of general benefit that the silent one, by his seclusion, removes the temptations which would inevitably arise from his unedifying life among people and be injurious to the morals of his neighbors. Right? So those just reinforcing that notion that you doing your practice in silence on your own is the greatest service you can offer to the world. It's the highest service that you can offer to the world because what will come from it is the direct expression of God through you. Know that, that you become a manifestation through that silence, through that communion with the beloved within, you become a portal for the activity of God. You become the whole through which God is seen and experienced in the world. And so it's a great benefit that you do in your service by doing your practice and by simply sitting in the company of God. You may not see it, you may not understand it, and that's all the better, you know, to go out unassuming and to end up being a service to the world because you care, because your heart is clean and wiped away with the ideas of me and mine. You will be radically different than anything else the world has seen. You will be a salve to the sorrow in the world. You will be a great friend. You'll be a great encourager. You'll be a, a, a great mourner. You will be able to sit with, with the saddened and the broken, and you will actually be able to give them some peace, not from you, but from that hole through which God is seen in you. And so do not think that doing your practice is a selfish thing. Or... <laughs> You know, one of my one of my very first conversations with Swami Prabodhananda in the in the monastery was about this exactly. Because I told him, I said, Maharaj, all I do all day long is sit here in this monastery, isolated from the world, you know, just doing my practice and doing my meditation, doing my studies and serving in the garden and preparing food. I said, but it's just all about me. And I just feel like that's just selfish. Shouldn't I be out there doing volunteer work and, and 
you know, helping, helping the neighbors and whatnot. I said, it seems to me that Vedanta is selfish. And <laughs> he smiled and he looked at me, he gave me a shocking answer actually, because I was, I was actually trying to get a little bit of a rise out of that statement. And he looked at me and he said, well, it is true. Vedanta is selfish. He says, but if you practice it properly, your idea of self will encompass the whole world. And so if you learn to expand your sense of self, be selfish because everyone will benefit because your sense of self includes them. You know that you are one with the world. You'll know that you are every man and every woman and your selfishness will be manifesting through your service to that self and everyone. And I thought, what a great answer. <laughs> you know, at the beginning, it is selfish. It is just you working on yourself. But in the end, that working on yourself is what's going to enable you to become a servant to everyone without, without the effort, with, without the idea of serving. It will be a oneness. It will be a natural response between your, your highest self and the world. So this, this is a wonderful ideal and, and is a great way to practice, to know that, that this is your service to the world, to God and man. This is your faithfulness to mother. Sit and dedicate yourself and to undo the me and mine that has taken control and thereby become a blessing to everyone. On the subject of the importance of silence, St. Isaac the Syrian exclaimed the following, when on one side we place all the actions of this life and on the other, silence, we find that it weighs down the scales. Do not place those who perform signs and wonders in the world on a level with those who keep silence with knowledge. Love, love the inactivity of silence more than the satiety of greedy ones in the world and the turning of many people to God. It is better for you to cut yourself free from the bonds of sin than to liberate slaves from their servitude. Even the most elementary sages have recognized the value of silence. The philosophical school of the Neoplatonists, which embraced many adherents under the guidance of the philosopher Plotinus, developed to a high degree the inner contemplative life, which is attained most especially in silence. One spiritual writer said that if the state were developed to the highest degree of education and morals, yet even then, it would still be necessary to provide people for, con for contemplation in addition to the general activities of citizens in order to preserve the spirit of truth and having received it from all the centuries that are past to keep it for the generations to come and to hand it on to posterity. Such people in the church are hermits, recluses, and anchorites. Right? And so to have to constantly have a plethora of people, you know, dedicated to this silent integrity within uh, is necessary. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, we can see what happens, actually. <laughs> we can see. Uh, you know, in the Catholic Church, uh, they, have, they have many of these orders that are hermitages where they, you know, there's one, there's a great movie, if you ever want to watch very boring but very beautiful movie called uh, Integrate Silence and it's it's a, a man who gets permission it's funny because he went to a to a, I think it's Carmelites monastery in the south of France and uh, it was a monastery of hermits which means these guys don't leave the monastery uh, and actually they don't leave their room except on Sundays to spend time in the in the church but uh he wanted to do a documentary on them. So he went to the abbot of the monastery and the abbot said, no, not now. I'll let you know when, a good, when it's a good time. 15 years passed. <laughs> and after 15 years, the abbot gets in touch with this documentarian and says, okay, now is the time. Come and live with us for one year. 
and create your documentary. And this movie uh, is simply a real life filming of these hermits, of these monks. There's no commentary, uh, there, there's no soundtrack. Uh, it's all filmed with, with what actually was happening and going on. And you get to spend this time, this one year with these monks. And they, they literally live in their rooms. Uh, their meals are handed to them through a hole in the door. They get one loaf of bread, one bowl of soup, and one chunk of cheese every day. They live in silence. Each of their rooms has its own chapel in it and a, a walled garden outside the back that's got like a 10-foot wall around it, so there's no looking over the wall. And they spend their time utterly alone in prayer. And uh, the Catholic Church's attitude toward these people, as it comes out in the movie, is that they are the battery of the church, that they, that they are the power of the church. You know, that, that, that is where where God reaches uh, the rest of the church. And it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, movie. There's one part in the movie where I, I, don't, I can't remember how many months there are. It's like, I don't know, somewhere around 10 or something. I don't remember. But each month, the camera sits and, and gets a close up, like their face is like right like that. And they look into the camera and nothing is said. And he just leaves it, the camera on their face for one or two minutes, which is a very long time in film. And all you're doing is looking into the eyes of, the, of each of the monks like that. It's such a beautiful movie, but you almost have to be a monk to watch it because the pace is so <laughs> slow. It just, nothing exciting happens in the whole movie. It's just, it's really a journey into silence, into the contemplative life of these monks and there is no excitement in their lives except for on Sundays Sundays they, they have this wonderful time in the afternoon after church and after lunch they get two hours where they go for a walk together and where they can they and and, and they uh, take a hike up in the mountains together and it is wonderful to watch their playfulness you know these are old men and they're literally playing like little boys, you know, throwing snowballs at each other and laughing and wrestling and pushing each other down the hill. <laughs> it's really, it's amazing. It's really a great movie. So if you ever get a chance to watch it or want to find it, uh, it's called The Integrate Silence. So, all right. So The Pilgrim uh, says, I think, that no one has so truly valued the excellences of silence as St. John of the Latter. Silence, he says, is the mother of prayer, a return from the captivity of sin, unconscious success in virtue, a continuous ascension to heaven. So let's look at those, each one of them. It's the mother of prayer. It gives birth to real prayer, that inner silence. Because in that silence, it's just an open communication between the heart of the devotee and the beloved. Nothing said. It's, it's, it's an absolute surrender of innocence, an absolute surrender of any protection or defensiveness or separation whatsoever. That silence is a removal of any distance between you and the beloved. And that gives birth to real prayer, to real communion. Real, real bliss, wonder, wonder. It's the mother of prayer, a return from the captivity of sin, right? The captivity of sin, that's, that is being stuck in the, in the active mind, not being able to be free from mind, not being able to be free from your thoughts, not being able to be free from cause and effect and from the passage of time. You know, it's your karma. It's, it's the past, present, and future, and the brutality of being stuck in that. So it gives you release from this unhelpful uh, mind, the mind that's nailing you to the wall all the time. Unconscious success and virtue. This is beautiful. This idea of unconscious success and virtue which means that it's virtue that grows independent of the effort of the ego self. 
It's not growing because of your effort. It's not growing because of your doing. It's not, it's not your achievement. It's simply because you have been in the presence of God and have gotten suntanned. <laughs> Nothing that you did was responsible for that suntan. It happened naturally by being in the presence of God with a full and beautiful attention, a silence of awe, a silence of love. Now to, sit, <laughs> to sit there in the presence like that, just be changed, just be transformed, you know, without your knowing. You become a beautiful person unaware of your beauty. Very, very most beautiful type of beauty. You know, that gorgeous, you know, wonderfully beautiful person who is unaware that they're beautiful, that humility is their cover, you know, modesty is their sign. It's a wonderful thing. And this is what happens to us just by sitting in the presence of God in a sincere and earnest way. You become a marvel, unaware of your own marvelousness. <laughs> Beautiful idea here, unconscious success and virtue. A continuous ascension to heaven, you know, that in that silence of mind, you experience your immortality now. You experience your infinity now. You experience your freedom from karma now. You know, what does heaven hold for you that is any better than that? You know, this presence of the divine a freeness and the absolute forgiveness through grace, the, the, the embrace of an infinite love, a, a, a direct, direct experience, not one interpreted by senses, not one that comes in through the nose or the eyes or the ears or the skin you know, or the mouth, but a knowledge that comes directly through the back door of the mind, an infinite knowledge spontaneously available, an infinite love, singing a bliss that, that, that just soothes every part of you. This, this is that ascension to heaven of silence. Oh, wonderful. Yes, and Jesus Christ himself, in order to show us the advantage and necessity of silent seclusion, often left his public preaching and went into silent places for prayer and quietude. The Garden of Gethsemane is a perfect example of that. You know, that he went in and poured out his heart to the divine. It's where the intimacy happens. That's why Takor tells us, look, go, go regularly. Take some time in solitude where you go and spend a day or two every so often with no cell phones, no friends, no distractions whatsoever. Just take a day every now and then and go into silence apart from everything. You know, a nice place to go uh, that's outside of your world, out of the reach of your relatives and, and friends. And go be with God. Go find this beloved. And don't be discouraged. If it's <laughs> In the beginning, it, it, it can be boring. You know, so there, it seems like a lot of work to sit there in silence and you're sitting there, oh man, I could be at Starbucks. You know? <laughs> It happens like that in the beginning. Don't be discouraged by that. That's just the noisy uh, toddler of the mind. You know? It takes some practice to be able to, to sit in the silence in a way that, that, that betrays the presence of God to you. But do it regularly. Make time. It's important that you do it. Because every day, especially if you're working in the world, look how many hours of the day you're exposed to the world and its duality. You know, look at how many hours of the day you're exposed to the actions of the ego, taking responsibility for doership of everything. All the people that you're around who are reinforcing wrong ideas of what we are and who we are, getting pulled into arguments and pulled into politics and pulled into just, you know, sexualities and all manner of things in the world. Every now and then, you know, Tapur says, gosh, Get out of that space. Get out of that world for a day or two days. You know, 
on a regular basis and spend those days just taking a silent walk, noticing God everywhere, sharing your thoughts, opening your heart, feeling the presence, accepting the bliss, accepting grace. The silent con contemplates are like pillars supporting the devotion of the church by their secret, continuous prayer. Even in the distant past, one sees that many devout layfolk and even kings and their courtiers went to visit hermits and men who kept silence in order to ask them to pray for their strengthening and salvation. Thus, the silent recluse, too, can serve his neighbor and act to the advantage and the happiness of society by his secluded prayer, by her secluded prayer. This, this is very important. So, so take your time to do this. You never will regret it. All right, so the professor says here, now there again, that is a thought which I do not very easily understand. It is a general custom among all of us Christians to ask for each other's prayers to want another to pray for me and to have special confidence in a member of the church, is not this simply a demand of self-love? Is it not that we have only caught the habit of saying what we have heard others say as a sort of fancy of the mind without any serious consideration? Does God require human intercession since he foresees everything and acts according to his all-blessed providence and not according to our desire? knowing and settling everything before our petition is made, as the Holy Gospel says, can the prayer of many people really be any stronger to overcome his decisions than the prayer of one person? In that case, God would be a respecter of persons. Can the prayer of another person really save me when everybody is commended or put to shame on the ground of his own actions? And therefore, the request for the prayers of another person is, to my mind, merely a pious expression of spiritual courtesy, which shows signs of humility and a desire to please by preferring one another. And that is all. So he's clearly the, the uh, antagonist here, <laughs> the worldly antagonist, taking these, these points. The monk. If one take only outward considerations into account, and with an elementary philosophy, it might be put in that way. But the spiritual reason, blessed by the light of religion and trained by the experience of the interior life, goes a good deal deeper, contemplates more clearly, and in a mystery reveals something entirely different from what you have put forward. So that we may understand this more quickly and clearly, let us take an example and then verify the truth of it from the word of God. Let us say that a pupil came to a certain teacher for instruction. His feeble capacities, and what is more, his idleness and lack of concentration, prevented him from attaining any success in his studies, and they put him in the category of the idle and unsuccessful. Feeling sad at this, he did not know what to do, nor how to contend with his deficiencies. Then he met another pupil, a classmate of his, who was more able than he, more diligent and successful, and he explained his trouble to him. The other took an interest in him and invited him to work with him. Let us work together, he said, and we shall be keener, more cheerful, and therefore more successful. And so they began to study together, each sharing with the other what he understood. The subject of their study was the same, and what followed after several days? The indifferent one became diligent. He came to like his work. His carelessness was changed to ardor and intelligence, which had a beneficial effect upon his character and the morals also. And the intelligent one, in his turn, became more able and industrious. In the effect they had upon one another, they arrived at a common advantage. And this is very natural, for a man is born in the society of people. He develops this rational understanding through people, habits of life, 
training, emotions, the action of the will. In a word, everything he receives from the example of his kind. And therefore, as the life of men consists in the closest relations and the strongest influence of one upon another, he who lives among the certain sort of people becomes accustomed to that kind of habit, behavior, and morals. What he's really describing here in somewhat of a roundabout way is holy company. This is what you are to each other, right? This is what you are to each other. You're, you, the stronger of you, you know, loves, encourages, and, 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 and reaches out and is a positive example to each other, right? And each of us can be strong in different ways. And so it's not that just one person is always in the lead, one person is always following. It's in one way you're strong and the other person is weak. In another way, they are strong and you are weak. And so by our standing together, by our reaching out and being an encouraging light to each other, we pull each other up. We are greater as a whole than we are individually. That is the point of Sangha. I think that this is a safe place to practice love. This is a safe way to practice forgiveness, to practice encouragement uh, with each other. And so this is what he's talking about here. Consequently, the cool become enthusiastic. The stupid become sharp. The idle are aroused to activity by a lively interest in their fellow men. Spirit can give itself to spirit and act beneficially upon another and attract another to prayer, to attention. It can encourage him in despondency, turn him from vice, and arouse him to holy action. And so by helping each other, they can become more devout, more energetic spiritually, more reverent. There you have the secret of prayer for others, which explains the devout custom in the part of Christian people of praying for one another and asking for the prayers of the brethren. And from this one, what, and from this, one can see that it is not that God is pleased, as the great ones in this world are, by a great many petitions and intercessions, but that the very spirit and power of prayer cleanses and arouses the soul for whom the prayer is offered and presents it ready for union with God. If mutual prayer by those who are living upon the earth is so beneficial, then in the same way, we may infer that prayer for the departed also is mutually beneficial because of the very close link that exists between the heavenly world and this. In this way, souls of the church militant can be drawn into union with souls of the church triumphant, or that, or what is the same thing, the living with the dead. Okay, I'm not, we don't have to go into that one too close, but just this notion that it's a great benefit you know, that we pray for each other. And it's wonderfully encouraging. You know, whatever your beliefs are in prayer, what anybody's beliefs are in prayer, it's really always is very encouraging to know somebody is praying for you. You know, it's always a wonderful thing when you find out that someone you asked to pray for, for something has been doing it. And, and, and that's how we lift each other up, you know, through integrity and a compassion for one another. And, and, and it teaches us humility. Because asking for help uh, is our is our way of confession, you know, to say, hey, bro, you know, I'm really having a struggle with this. Can you call me, you know, and just ask me every now and then if I'm doing my practice or, you know, how am I feeling about my spiritual life, you know, or you pick particular things that you need help with and you just call and make arrangements to get support for one another. And through that, we become accountable when we ourselves are not holding ourselves accountable. And through that, we get encouraged instead of getting caught up in our failure and getting isolated because we think everybody else is doing so well and we're doing terribly. And then we, then we start putting on shows for one another. You know, that <laughs> I'm this way, I, I can do this, that, and the other. That's not necessary and it's not helpful. Be honest about who you are. In that way, you can find help from your brothers and sisters. And in that way, you find tolerance for their weaknesses. And together, we find an enthusiasm for helping, for lifting up, for protecting, 
for serving, for caring in each other. So this, this is how it's done. And it all begins with each one of us sitting in silence with our beloved, becoming aware of our divine nature so that it can express freely, so that it can express equanimously for each other, not in judgments, not in withdrawals, not in divisions, but in the union of love, which is the natural way, which is what we are as human beings and what you are as the image of God. These are the gems that are lie within you, scattered in the outer courts of your heart, Ramakrishna sang. All that I have said is psychologically reasoning, but if we open the Holy Scriptures, we can verify the truth of it. One, Jesus Christ says to the Apostle Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. There you see that the power of Christ's prayer strengthens the spirit of St. Peter and encourages him when his faith is tested. Two, when the Apostle Peter was kept in prison, prayer was made without ceasing of the of the church unto God for him. Here we have revealed the help which brotherly prayer gives to the troubled circumstances of life. Three, but the clearest precept about prayer for others is put by the Holy Apostle James in this way. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Here is the definite confirmation of the psychological argument above. And what are we to say of the example of the Holy Apostle Paul, which is given to us as the pattern of prayer for one another? One writer observes that this example of the Holy Apostle Paul should teach us how necessary prayer for one another is when so holy and strong a hadvijnik, that's, that's a, you know, an adept, a spiritual adept, acknowledges his own need of this spiritual help. In the epistle of the Hebrews, <coughs> he words his request in this way, pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. When we take note of this, how unreasonable it seems to rely upon our own prayers and successes only, when a man so holy, so full of grace in his humility, Ask for the prayers of his neighbors to be joined to his own. Therefore, in humility, simplicity, and unity of love, we should not reject or disdain the help of the prayers of even the feeblest of believers when the clear-sighted spirit of the Apostle Paul felt no hesitation about it. He asks for the prayers of all in general, knowing that the power of God is made perfect in weakness. Consequently, it can at times be made perfect in those who seem able to pray but feebly. Feeling the force of this example, we notice further that prayer, one for another, strengthens that unity in Christian love, or just holy love, it's only limited, in holy love, which is commanded by God, witnesses to humility in the spirit of him who makes the request and, so to speak, attracts the spirit of him who prays. Mutual intercession is stimulated in this way. All right. We're going to stop there because this, the professor is probably going to pick another fight here. And we don't have time to go through all of the retort. So we'll leave it with that wonderful space right there.